Consider the Lobster, written by David Foster Wallace in 2004. The enormous, pungent, and extremely well-marketed Maine Lobster Festival is held every late July in the state's mid-coast region, meaning the western side of Penobscot Bay, the nerve stem of Maine's lobster industry. What's called the mid-coast runs from Owl's Head and Thomaston in the south to Belfast in the north. Actually, it might extend all the way up to Bucksport, but we were never able to get farther north than Belfast on Route 1, whose summer traffic is, as you can imagine, unimaginable. The region's two main communities are Camden, with its very old money and Yachty Harbor, and five-star restaurants and phenomenal B&Bs, and Rockland, a serious old fishing town that hosts the festival every summer in historic Harbor Park, right along the water. Footnote 1. There's a comprehensive native apothem. Camden by the sea, Rockland by the smell. Tourism and lobster are the mid-coast region's two main industries, and they're both warm weather enterprises. And the Maine Lobster Festival represents less an intersection of the industries than a deliberate collision, joyful and lucrative and loud. The assigned subject of this gourmet article is the 56th annual MLF, July 30th to August 3rd, 2003, whose official theme this year was Lighthouses, Laughter, and Lobster. Total paid attendance was over 100,000, due partly to a national CNN spot in June, during which a senior editor of Food and Wine magazine hailed the MLF as one of the best food-themed galas in the world. 2003 Festival Highlights, concert by Leanne Womack and the Orleans, annual Maine Sea Goddess Beauty Pageant, Saturday's Big Parade, Sunday's William G. Atwood Memorial Crate Race, annual amateur cooking competition, carnival rides and midway attractions and food booths, and the MLF's main eating tent, where something over 25,000 pounds of fresh-caught Maine lobster is consumed after preparation in the world's largest lobster cooker, near the ground's north entrance. Also available are lobster rolls, lobster turnovers, lobster saute, down east lobster salad, lobster bisque, lobster ravioli, and deep fried lobster dumplings. Lobster thermidor is obtainable at a sit down restaurant called the Black Pearl on Harbor Park's Northwest Wharf. A large all pine booth, sponsored by the Maine Lobster Promotion Council, has free pamphlets with recipes eating tips, and lobster fun facts. The winner of Friday's amateur cooking competition prepares saffron lobster ramekins, the recipe for which is now available for public downloading at www.mainlobsterfestival.com. There are lobster t-shirts and lobster bobblehead dolls, and inflatable pool toys and clamp-on lobster hats, with big scarlet claws that wobble on springs. Your assigned correspondent saw it all, accompanied by one girlfriend and both of his parents, one of which parents was actually born and raised in Maine, albeit in the extreme northern inland part, which is potato country, and a world away from the touristic mid-coast. Footnote 2. Nota Bene. All personally connected parties have made it clear from the start that they do not want to be talked about in this article. For practical purposes, everyone knows what a lobster is. As usual, though, there's much more to know than most of us care about. It's all a matter of what your interests are. Taxonomically speaking, a lobster is a marine crustacean of the family Homeridae, characterized by five pairs of jointed legs the first pair terminating in large pincerish claws used for subduing prey. Like many other species of benthic carnivore, lobsters are both hunters and scavengers. They have stalked eyes, gills on their legs, and antennae 
there are a dozen or so different kinds worldwide, of which the relevant species here is the main lobster, Homarus americanus. The name lobster comes from the Old English labestre, which is thought to be a corrupt form of the Latin word for locust combined with the Old English lop, which means spider. Moreover, a crustacean is an aquatic arthropod of the class Crustacea, which comprises crabs, shrimp, barnacles, lobsters, and freshwater crayfish. All this right there in the encyclopedia. And arthropods are members of the phylum Anthropoda, which phylum covers insects, spiders, crustaceans, centipedes, and millipedes, all of whose main commonality, beside the absence of a centralized brain-spine assembly, is a chitinous exoskeleton composed of segments to which appendages are articulated in pairs. The point is that lobsters are basically giant sea insects. Footnote 3. Midcoaster's native term for a lobster is, in fact, bug, as in come around Sunday and we'll cook up some bugs. Like most arthropods, they date from the Jurassic period, biologically so much older than mammalia that they might as well be from another planet. And they are, particularly in their natural brown-green state, brandishing their claw-like weapons and with thick antennae a whip, not nice to look at. And it's true that they are garbage men of the sea, eaters of dead stuff. Footnote 4. Factoid. Lobster traps are usually baited with dead herring. Although they'll also eat some live shellfish, certain kinds of injured fish, and sometimes one another. But they are themselves good eating, or so we think now. Up until some time in the 1800s, though, Lobster was literally low-class food, eaten only by the poor and institutionalized. Even in the harsh penal environment of early America, some colonies had laws against feeding lobsters to inmates more than once a week because it was thought to be cruel and unusual, like making people eat rats. One reason for their low status was how plentiful lobsters were in Old New England. Unbelievable abundance is how one source describes the situation, including accounts of Plymouth pilgrims wading out and capturing all they wanted by hand, and of early Boston's seashore being littered with lobsters after hard storms. These latter were treated as a smelly nuisance and ground up for fertilizer. There is also the fact that pre-modern lobster was cooked dead and then preserved usually packed in salt or crude hermetic containers. Maine's earliest lobster industry was based around a dozen such seaside canneries in the early 1840s, from which lobster was shipped as far away as California, in demand only because it was cheap and high in protein, basically chewable fuel. Now, of course, lobster is posh, a delicacy, only a step or two down from caviar. The meat is richer and more substantial than most fish. Its taste subtle compared to the marine gaminess of mussels and clams. In the US, pop food imagination, lobster is now the seafood analog to steak, with which it's so often twinned as surf and turf on the really expensive part of the chain steakhouse menu. In fact, one obvious project of the MLF and of its omnipresently sponsorial Maine Lobster Promotional Council is to counter the idea that lobster is unusually luxe or unhealthy or expensive, suitable for a fete palates or the occasional blow the diet treat. It is emphasized over and over in presentations and pamphlets at the festival that lobster meat has fewer calories less cholesterol, and less saturated fat than chicken. Footnote 5. Of course, the common practice of dipping the lobster meat in melted butter torpedoes all these happy fat specks, which none of the council's promotional stuff ever mentions, any more than potato industry PR 
talks about sour cream and bacon bits. And in the main eating tent, you can get a quarter, industry shorthand for a one and one quarter pound lobster, a four ounce cup of melted butter, a bag of chips, and a soft roll with butter pat for around $12, which is only slightly more expensive than supper at McDonald's. Be apprised, though, that the Maine Lobster Festival's democratization of lobster comes with all the massed inconvenience and aesthetic compromise of real democracy. See, for example, the aforementioned Maine Eating Tent, for which there is a constant Disneyland grade queue, and which turns out to be a square quarter mile of awning shaded cafeteria lines and rows of long institutional tables at which friend and stranger alike sit cheek by jowl, cracking and chewing and dribbling. It's hot, and the sagged roof traps the steam and the smells, which latter are strong and only partly food-related. It is also loud, and a good percentage of the total noise is masticatory. The suppers come in styrofoam trays, and the soft drinks are iceless and flat, and the coffee is convenient store coffee in more styrofoam, and the utensils are plastic. There are none of the special long skinny forks for pushing out the tail meat, though a few savvy diners bring their own. Nor do they give you near enough napkins considering how messy lobster is to eat, especially when you're squeezed onto benches alongside children of various ages and vastly different levels of fine motor development. Not to mention the people who've somehow smuggled in their own beer in enormous aisle-blocking coolers, or who all of a sudden produce their own plastic tablecloths and spread them over large portions of tables to try to reserve them, the tables, for their own little groups, and so on. Any one example is no more than a petty inconvenience, of course, but the MLF turns out to be full of irksome little downers like this. See, for instance, the main stage's headliner shows, where it turns out that you have to pay $20 extra for a folding chair if you want to sit down. Or the North Tent's mad scramble for the NyQuil cup size samples of finalist entries handed out after the cooking competition. Or the much-touted Maine Sea Goddess pageant finals, which turn out to be excruciatingly long and to consist mainly of endless thanks and tributes to local sponsors. Let's not even talk about the grossly inadequate Port A. San facilities, or the fact that there is nowhere to wash your hands before or after eating. What the Maine Lobster Festival really is, is a mid-level county fair with a culinary hook. And in this respect, it's not unlike Tidewater Crab Festivals, Midwest Corn Festivals, Texas Chili Festivals, etc., and shares with these venues the core paradox of all teeming commercial demotic events. It's not for everyone. Footnote 6. In truth, there's a great deal to be said about the differences between working-class Rockland and the heavily populist flavor of its festival versus comfortable and elitist Camden, with its expensive view and shops, given entirely over to $200 sweaters and great rows of Victorian homes converted to upscale B&Bs. And about these differences as two sides of the great coin, that is U.S. tourism, very little of which will be said here, except to amplify the above-mentioned paradox and to reveal your assigned correspondent's own preferences. I confess that I have never understood why so many people's idea of a fun vacation is to don flip-flops and sunglasses and crawl through maddening traffic to loud, hot, crowded tourist venues in order to sample a local flavor that is by definition ruined by the presence of tourists. This may, as my festival companions keep pointing out, all be a matter of personality and hardwired taste. The fact that I do not like tourist venues means that I'll never understand their appeal, and so I'm probably not the one to talk about it, the supposed appeal. But since this footnote will almost surely not survive magazine editing anyway, 
Here goes. As I see it, it probably really is good for the soul to be a tourist, even if it's only once in a while. Not good for the soul in a refreshing or enlivening way, though, but rather in a grim, steely-eyed, let's look honestly at the facts and find some way to deal with them way. My personal experience has not been that traveling around the country is broadening or relaxing, or that radical changes in place and context have a salutary effect, but rather that international tourism is radically constricting and humbling in the hardest way. Hostile to my fantasy of being a true individual, of living somehow outside and above it all. Coming up is the part that my companions find especially unhappy and repellent, a sure way to spoil the fun of vacation travel. To be a mass tourist for me is to become a pure late-date American, alien, ignorant, greedy for something that you cannot ever have, disappointed in a way you can never admit. It is to spoil, by way of sheer ontology, the very unspoiledness you are there to experience. It is to impose yourself on places that in non-economic ways would be better, realer, without you. It is, in lines and gridlock, and transaction after transaction, to confront a dimension of yourself that is as inescapable as it is painful. As a tourist, you become economically significant but existentially loathsome, an insect on a dead thing. Back to the main text. Nothing against the euphoric senior editor of Food and Wine, but I'd be surprised if she'd ever actually been here in Harbor Park, amid crowds of people slapping Canal Zone mosquitoes as they eat deep-fried Twinkies and watch Professor Paddywhack on six-foot stilts in a raincoat with plastic lobsters protruding from all directions on springs terrify their children. Lobster is essentially a summer food. This is because we now prefer our lobsters fresh, which means they have to be recently caught, which for both tactical and economic reasons take place at depths less than 25 fathoms. Lobsters tend to be hungriest and most active, i.e. most trappable, at summer water temperatures of 45 to 50 degrees. In the autumn, most Maine lobsters migrate out into deeper water, either for warmth or to avoid the heavy waves that pound New England's coast all winter. Some burrow into the bottom. They might hibernate. Nobody's sure. Summer is also lobster's molting season, specifically early to mid-July. Chitinous arthropods grow by molting, rather like the way people have to buy bigger clothes as they age and gain weight. Since lobsters can live to be over 100, they can also get to be quite large, as in 30 pounds or more. Though truly senior lobsters are rare now because New England's waters are so heavily trapped. Footnote 7. Datum. In a good year, the U.S. industry produces about 80 million pounds of lobster and Maine accounts for more than half that total. Anyway, hence the culinary distinction between hard and soft-shell lobsters, the latter sometimes also known as shredders. A soft-shell lobster is one that has recently molted. In mid-coast restaurants, the summer menu often offers both kinds, with shredders being slightly cheaper even though they're easier to dismantle and the meat is allegedly sweeter. The reason for the discount is that a molting lobster uses a layer of seawater for insulation while its new shell is hardening, so there's slightly less actual meat when you crack open a shedder, plus a redolent gout of water that gets all over everything and can sometimes jet out lemon-like and catch a table mate right in the eye. If it's winter, or you're buying lobster someplace far from New England, on the other hand, you can almost bet that the lobster is a hard shell, which for obvious reasons travels better. As an a la carte entree, lobster can be baked 
broiled, steamed, grilled, sautéed, stir-fried, or microwaved. The most common method, though, is boiling. If you're someone who enjoys having lobster at home, this is probably the way you do it, since boiling is so easy. You need a large kettle with cover, which you fill about half full with water. The standard device is that you want two and a half quarts of water per lobster. Seawater is optimal, or you can add two tablespoons of salt per quart from the tap. It also helps to know how much your lobsters weigh. You can get the water boiling, put in the lobsters one at a time, cover the kettle, and bring it back up to a boil. Then you bank the heat and let the kettle simmer. 10 minutes for the first pound of lobster, then three minutes for each pound after that. This is assuming you've got hard shell lobsters, which again, if you don't live between Boston and Halifax, is probably what you've got. For shutters, you're supposed to subtract three minutes from the total. The reason the kettle's lobsters turn scarlet is that boiling somehow suppresses every pigment in their chitin but one. If you want an easy test of whether the lobsters are done, you try pulling on one of their antennae. If it comes out of the head with minimal effort, you're ready to eat. A detail so obvious that most recipes don't even bother to mention it is that each lobster is supposed to be alive when you put it in the kettle. This is part of lobster's modern appeal. It's the freshest food there is. There's no decomposition between harvesting and eating. And not only do lobsters require no cleaning or dressing or plucking, they're relatively easy for vendors to keep alive. They can come up alive in the traps, are placed in containers of seawater, and can, so long as the water is aerated and the animal's claws are pegged or banded to keep them from tearing one another up under the stresses of captivity, Footnote 8. Nota bene. Similar reasoning underlies the practice of what's termed deep eking broiler chickens and brood hens in modern factory farms. Maximum commercial efficiency requires that enormous poultry populations be confined in unnaturally close quarters, under which conditions many birds go crazy and peck one another to death. As a purely observational side note, be apprised that debeaking is usually an automated process and that the chickens receive no anesthetic. It's not clear to me whether most gourmet readers know about debeaking or about related practices like dehorning cattle in commercial feedlots, cropping swine's tails in factory hog farms to keep psychotically bored neighbors from chewing them off, and so forth. It so happens that your assigned correspondent knew almost nothing about standard meat industry operations before starting work on this article. Back to the main text. Survive right until they're boiled. Most of us have been in supermarkets or restaurants that feature tanks of live lobsters from which you can pick out your supper while it watches you point. And part of the overall spectacle of the Maine Lobster Festival is that you can see actual lobstermen's vessels docking at the wharves along the northeastern grounds and unloading fresh caught product, which is transferred by hand or cart 150 yards to the great clear tanks stacked up around the festival's cooker, which is, as mentioned, billed as the world's largest lobster cooker and can process over 100 lobsters at a time for the main eating tent. So then here is a question that's all but unavoidable at the world's largest lobster cooker and may arise in kitchens across the U.S. Is it all right to boil a sentient creature alive just for our gustatory pleasure? A related set of concerns. Is the previous question irksomely PC or sentimental? What does all right even mean in this context? Is the whole thing just a matter of personal choice? As you may or may not know, a certain well-known group called People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals thinks that the morality of lobster boiling 
is not just a matter of individual conscience. In fact, one of the very first things we hear about the MLF, well, to set the scene, we're coming in by cab from the almost indescribably odd and rustic Knox County Airport, footnote 9. The terminal used to be somebody's house, for example, and the lost luggage reporting room was clearly once a pantry. Very late on the night before the festival opens, sharing the cab with a wealthy political consultant who lives on Vinyl Haven Island in the bay half of the year. He's headed for the island ferry in Rockland. The consultant and the cab driver are responding to informal journalistic probes about how people who live in the mid-coast region actually view the MLF, as in, is the festival just a big dollar tourist thing, or is it something local residents look forward to attending, take genuine civic pride in, etc. The cab driver, who's in his 70s, one of apparently a whole platoon of retirees the cab company puts on to help with the summer rush, and wears a US flag lapel pin, and drives in what can be only called a very deliberate way, assures us that the locals do endorse and enjoy the MLF, although he himself hasn't gone in years, and now come to think of it, no one he and his wife know has either. However, the demi-local consultant's been to recent festivals a couple of times. One gets the impression it was at his wife's behest, of which his most vivid impression was that you have to line up for an ungodly long time to get your lobsters, and meanwhile, there are all these ex-flower children coming up and down along the line handing out pamphlets that say lobsters die in terrible pain and you shouldn't eat them. And it turns out that the post-hippies of the consultant's recollection were activists from PETA, there were no PETA people in obvious view at the 2003 MLF. Footnote 10. It turned out that one Mr. William R. Rivas Rivas, a high-ranking PETA official out of the group's Virginia headquarters, was indeed there this year, albeit solo, working the festival's main and side entrances on Saturday, August 2nd handing out pamphlets and adhesive stickers emblazoned with Being Boiled Hurts, which is the tagline in most of PETA's published material about lobsters. I learned that he'd been there only later when speaking with Mr. Rivas Rivas on the phone. I'm not sure how we missed seeing him in situ at the festival, and I can't see much to do except apologize for the oversight. Although it's also true that Saturday was the day of the big MLF parade through Rockland, which basic journalistic responsibility seemed to require going to, and which, with all due respect, meant that Saturday was maybe not the best day for PETA to work the Harbor Park grounds, especially if it was going to be just one person for one day since a lot of die-hard MLF partisans were off-site watching the parade, which, again, with no offense intended, was in truth kind of cheesy and boring, consisting mostly of slow, homemade floats and various mid-coast people waving at one another, and with an extremely annoying man dressed as Blackbeard, ranging up and down the length of the crowd, saying, Arr over and over, and brandishing a plastic sword at people, etc. Plus, it rained. Back to the text. But they've been conspicuous at many of the recent festivals. Since at least the mid-1990s, articles in everything from the Camden Herald to the New York Times have described PETA urging boycotts of the Maine Lobster Festival often deploying celebrity spokesmen like Mary Tyler Moore for open letters and ads saying stuff like, lobsters are extraordinarily sensitive. And to me, eating a lobster is out of the question. More concrete is the oral testimony of Dick, our florid and extremely gregarious rental car liaison. 
Footnote 11. By profession, Dick is actually a car salesman. The Midcoast region's national car rental franchise operates out of a Chevy dealership in Thomaston. To the effect that PETA has been around so much during recent years that a kind of brittly tolerant homeostasis now obtains between the activists and the festival's locals, e.g., we had some incidents a couple of years ago. One lady took most of her clothes off and painted herself like a lobster, almost got herself arrested, but for the most part, they're let alone. Rapid series of small, ambiguous laughs, which, with Dick, happens a lot. They do their thing, and we do our thing. This whole interchange takes place on Route 1, July 30th, during a 4-mile, 50-minute ride from the airport. Footnote 12. The short version regarding why we were back at the airport after already arriving the previous night involves lost luggage and a miscommunication about where and what the Mid-Coast National Franchise was. Dick came out personally to the airport and got us, out of no evident motive but kindness. He also talked nonstop the entire way, with a very distinctive speaking style that can be described only as manically laconic. The truth is that I now know more about this man than I do about some members of my own family. Back to the main text to the dealership to sign car rental papers. Several irreproducible segues down the road from the PETA anecdotes, Dick, whose son-in-law happens to be a professional lobsterman and one of the main eating tents regular suppliers, explains what he and his family feel is the crucial mitigating factor in the whole morality of boiling lobsters alive issue. There's a part of the brain in people and animals that lets us feel pain. And lobsters' brains don't have this part. Beside the fact that it's incorrect in about nine different ways, the main reason Dick's statement is interesting is that its thesis is more or less echoed by the festival's own pronouncement on lobsters and pain, which is part of the Test Your Lobster IQ quiz that appears in the 2003 MLF program courtesy of the Marine Lobster Promotion Council. The nervous system of a lobster is very simple and is, in fact, most similar to the nervous system of the grasshopper. It is decentralized with no brain. There is no cerebral cortex, which in humans is the area of the brain that gives the experience of pain. Though it sounds more sophisticated, a lot of the neurology in this latter claim is still either false or fuzzy. The human cerebral cortex is the brain part that deals with higher faculties like reason, metaphysical self-awareness, language, etc. Pain reception is known to be of a much older and more primitive system of nociceptors and prostaglandins that are managed by the brainstem and thalamus. Footnote 13. To elaborate by way of example, the common experience of accidentally touching a hot stove and yanking your hand back even before you're aware that anything's going on is explained by the fact that many of the processes by which we detect and avoid painful stimuli do not involve the cortex. In the case of the hand and the stove, the brain is bypassed altogether. All the important neurochemical action takes place in the spine. Back to the text. On the other hand, it is true that the cerebral cortex is involved in what's variously called suffering, distress, or the emotional experience of pain, i.e. experience painful stimuli as unpleasant, very unpleasant, unbearable, and so on. Before we go any further, let's acknowledge that the questions of whether and how different kinds of animals feel pain and of whether and why it might be justifiable to inflict pain on them in order to eat them, turn out to be extremely complex and difficult. And comparative neuroanatomy is only part of the problem. Since pain is a totally subjective mental experience, we do not have direct access to anyone or anything's pain but our own. 
and even just the principles by which we can infer that other human beings experience pain and have a legitimate interest in not feeling pain involve hardcore philosophy, metaphysics, epistemology, value theory, ethics. The fact that even the most highly evolved non-human mammals can't use language to communicate with us about their subjective mental experience is only the first layer of additional complication in trying to extend our reasoning about pain and morality to animals. And everything gets progressively more abstract and convolved as we move farther and farther from the higher type mammals into cattle and swine and dogs and cats and rodents, and then birds and fish, and finally invertebrates like lobsters. The more important point here, though, is that the whole animal cruelty and eating issue is not just complex, it's also uncomfortable. It is, at any rate, uncomfortable for me, and for just about everyone I know who enjoys a variety of foods and yet does not want to see herself as cruel or unfeeling. As far as I can tell, my own main way of dealing with this conflict has been to avoid thinking about the whole unpleasant thing. I should add that it appears to me unlikely that many readers of Gourmet wish to think about it either or to be queried about the morality of their eating habits in the pages of a culinary monthly. Since, however, the assigned subject of this article is what it was like to attend the 2003 MLF, and thus to spend several days in the midst of a great mass of Americans all eating lobster, and thus to be more or less impelled to think hard about lobster and the experience of buying and eating lobster, it turns out that there is no honest way to avoid certain moral questions. There are several reasons for this. For one thing, it's not just that lobsters get boiled alive. It's that you do it yourself, or at least it's done specifically for you, on site. Footnote 14. Morality-wise, let's concede that this cuts both ways. Lobster eating is at least not abetted by the system of corporate factory farms that produces most beef, pork, and chicken, because, if nothing else, of the way they're marketed and packaged for sale. We eat these latter meats without having to consider that they were once conscious, sentient creatures to whom horrible things were done. Nota bene. Horrible here meaning really, really horrible. Write off to PETA or PETA.org for their free Meet Your Meat video narrated by Mr. Alec Baldwin if you want to see just about everything meat-related that you don't want to see or think about. Nota bene. Not that PETA's any sort of font of unspun truth. Like many partisans in complex moral disputes, the PETA people are fanatics, and a lot of their rhetoric seems simplistic and self-righteous. But in this particular video, replete with actual factory farm and corporate slaughterhouse footage, is both credible and traumatizing. Back to the main text. As mentioned, the world's largest lobster cooker, which is highlighted as an attraction in the festival's program, is right out there on the MLF's north grounds for everyone to see. Try to imagine a Nebraska beef festival. Footnote 15. It is significant that lobster, fish, and chicken are our culture's words for both the animal and the meat, whereas most mammals seem to require euphemisms like beef and pork that help us separate the meat we eat from the living creature that the meat once was. Is this the evidence that some kind of deep unease about eating higher animals is endemic enough to show up in English usage? but that the unease diminishes as we move out of the mammalian order? And is lamb slash lamb the counterexample that sinks the whole theory, or are there special biblioco-historical reasons for this equivalence? Back to the main text. At which part of the festivities is watching trucks pull up and the live cattle get driven down the ramp 
and slaughtered right there on the world's largest killing floor or something. There's no way. The intimacy of the whole thing is maximized at home, which of course is where most lobster gets prepared and eaten. Although note already the semi-conscious euphemism prepared, which in the case of lobsters really means killing them right there in our kitchens. The basic scenario is that we come in from the store and make our own little preparations like getting the kettle filled and boiling, and then we lift the lobsters out of the bag or whatever retail container they happen to come home in, whereupon some uncomfortable things start to happen. However stuporous a lobster is from the trip home, for example, it tends to come alarmingly to life when placed in boiling water. If you're tilting it from a container into the steaming kettle, the lobster will sometimes try to cling to the container's sides or even to hook its claws over the kettle's rim, like a person trying to keep from going over the edge of a roof. And worse is when the lobster's fully immersed. Even if you cover the kettle and turn away, you can usually hear the cover rattling and clanking as the lobster tries to push it off or the creature's claws scraping the sides of the kettle as it thrashes around. The lobster, in other words, behaves very much as you or I would behave if we were plunged into boiling water, with the obvious exception of screaming. Footnote 16. There's a relevant populist myth about the high-pitched whistling sound that sometimes issues from a pot of boiling lobster. The sound is really vented steam from the layer of seawater between the lobster's flesh and its carapace. This is why shutters whistle more than hard shells. But the pop version has it that the sound is the lobster's rabbit-like death scream. Lobsters communicate via pheromones in their urine and don't have anything close to the vocal equipment for screaming but the myth's very persistent, which might, once again, point to a low-level cultural unease about the boiling thing. Back to the text. A blunter way to say this is that the lobster acts as if it's in terrible pain, causing some cooks to leave the kitchen altogether and to take one of those little lightweight plastic oven timers with them into another room and wait until the whole process is over. There happen to be two main criteria that most ethicists agree on for determining whether a living creature has the capacity to suffer and so has genuine interests that it may or may not be our moral duty to consider. Footnote 17. Interests basically means strong and legitimate preferences, which obviously require some degree of consciousness, responsiveness to stimuli, etc. See, for instance, the utilitarian philosopher Peter Singer, whose 1974 Animal Liberation is more or less the Bible of the modern animal rights movement. Begin quote, It would be nonsense to say that it was not in the interests of a stone to be kicked along the road by a schoolboy. A stone does not have interests because it cannot suffer. Nothing that we can do to it could possibly make any difference to its welfare. A mouse, on the other hand, does have an interest in not being kicked along the road, because it will suffer if it is." End quote. Back to the text. One is how much of the neurological hardware required for pain experience the animal comes equipped with. Nociceptors, prostaglandins, neuronal opioid receptors, etc. The other criterion is whether the animal demonstrates behavior associated with pain. And it takes a lot of intellectual gymnastics and behavioralist hair splitting not to see struggling, thrashing, and lid clattering as not just such pain behavior. According to marine zoologists, it usually takes lobsters between 35 and 45 seconds to die in boiling water. No source I could find talks about how long it takes them to die in superheated steam. One rather hopes it's faster. There are, of course, other ways to kill your lobster on site and so achieve maximum freshness. <laughs>
Some cooks practice is to drive a sharp, heavy knife point first into a spot just above the midpoint between the lobster's eye stalks, more or less where the third eye is in human foreheads. This is alleged either to kill the lobster instantly or to render it insensate, and is said to at least eliminate some of the cowardice involved in throwing a creature into boiling water and then fleeing the room. As far as I can tell from talking to proponents of the knife-in-head method, the idea is that it's more violent, but ultimately more merciful, plus that a willingness to exert personal agency and accept responsibility for stabbing the lobster's head honors the lobster somehow and entitles one to eat it. There's often a vague sort of Native American spirituality of the hunt flavor to pro-knife arguments. But the problem with the knife method is basic biology. Lobsters' nervous systems operate off of not one, but several ganglia, aka nerve bundles, which are sort of wired in series and distributed all along the lobster's underside, from stem to stern. And disabling only the frontal ganglion does not normally result in quick death or unconsciousness. Another alternative is to put the lobster in cold salt water and then very slowly bring it up to a full boil. Cooks who advocate this method are going on the analogy to a frog, which can supposedly be kept from jumping out of a boiling pot by heating the water incrementally. In order to save a lot of research summarizing, I'll simply assure you that the analogy between frogs and lobsters turns out not to hold. Plus, if the kettle's water isn't aerated seawater, the immersed lobster suffers from slow suffocation, although usually not decisive enough suffocation to keep it from thrashing and clattering when the water gets hot enough to kill it. In fact, lobsters boiled incrementally often display a whole bonus set of gruesome convulsion-like reactions that you don't see in regular boiling. Ultimately, the only certain virtues of the home lobotomy and slow heating methods are comparative, because there are even worse slash crueler ways people prepare lobster. Time thrifty cooks sometimes microwave them alive, usually after poking several vent holes in the carapace, which is a precaution most shellfish microwavers learn about the hard way. Live dismemberment, on the other hand, is big in Europe. Some chefs cut the lobster in half before cooking. Others like to tear off the claws and tails and only toss these parts into the pot. And there's more unhappy news respecting suffering criterion number one. Lobsters don't have much in the way of eyesight or hearing, but they do have an exquisite tactile sense, one facilitated by hundreds of thousands of tiny hairs that protrude through their carapace. Thus it is, in the words of T.M. Pruden's industry classic about lobster, that although encased in what seems a solid, impenetrable armor, the lobster can receive stimuli and impressions from without as readily as if it possessed a soft and delicate skin. And lobsters do have nociceptors. Footnote 18. This is the neurological term for special pain receptors that are sensitive to potentially damaging extremes of temperature, to mechanical forces, and to chemical substances, which are released when body tissues are damaged, as well as invertebrate versions of the prostaglandins and major neurotransmitters, via which our own brains register pain. Lobsters do not, on the other hand, appear to have the equipment for making or absorbing natural opioids like endorphins and encephalins, which are what more advanced nervous systems use to try to handle intense pain. From this fact, though, one could conclude either that lobsters are maybe even more vulnerable to pain since they lack mammalian nervous systems built in analgesia, or instead, that the absence of natural opioids implies an absence of the really intense pain sensations that natural opioids are designed to mitigate. I, for one, can detect a marked upswing in mood as I contemplate this latter possibility.
It could be that their lack of endorphin slash encephalin hardware means that lobsters' raw subjective experience of pain is so radically different from mammals that it may not even deserve the term pain. Perhaps lobsters are more like those frontal lobotomy patients one reads about who report experiencing pain in a totally different way than you or I. These patients evidently do feel physical pain, neurologically speaking, but don't dislike it, though neither do they like it. It's more that they feel it, but don't feel anything about it. The point being that the pain is not distressing to them or something they want to get away from. Maybe lobsters, who are also without frontal lobes, are detached from the neurological registration of injury or hazard we call pain in just the same way. There is, after all, a difference between one, pain as a purely neurological event, and two, actual suffering, which seems crucial to involve an emotional component, an awareness of pain as unpleasant, as something to fear slash dislike slash want to avoid. Still, after taking the abstract intellection, there remain the facts of the frantically clanking lid, the pathetic clinging to the edge of the pot. Standing at the stove, it is hard to deny in any meaningful way that this is a living creature experiencing pain and wishing to avoid slash escape the painful experience. To my lay mind, the lobster's behavior in the kettle appears to be the expression of a preference, and it may well be that an ability to form preferences is the decisive criterion for real suffering. Footnote 19. Preference is maybe roughly synonymous with interest, but it is a better term for our purposes because it's less abstractly philosophical. Preference seems more personal, and it's the whole idea of a living creature's personal experience that's at issue. The logic of this preference-suffering relation may be easiest to see in the negative case. If you cut certain kinds of worms in half, the halves will often keep crawling around and going about their vermiform business as if nothing had happened. When we assert, based on their post-op behavior, that these worms appear not to be suffering, what we're really saying is that there's no sign the worms know anything bad has happened or would prefer not to have gotten cut in half. Lobsters, though, are known to exhibit preferences. Experiments have shown that they can detect changes of only a degree or two in water temperature. One reason for their complex migratory cycles, which can often cover 100 plus miles a year, is to pursue the temperatures they like best. Footnote 20. Of course, the most common sort of counter-argument here would begin by objecting that the like best is really just a metaphor and a misleadingly anthropomorphic one at that. The counter-arguer would posit that the lobster seeks to maintain a certain optimal ambient temperature out of nothing but unconscious instinct, with a similar explanation for the low-light affinities upcoming in the main text. The thrust of such a counter-argument will be that the lobster's thrashings and clankings in the kettle express not unpreferred pain, but involuntary reflexes, like your leg shooting out when the doctor hits your knee. Be advised that there are professional scientists, including many researchers who use animals in experiments, who hold to the view that non-human creatures have no real feelings at all, merely behaviors. Be further advised that this view has a long history that goes all the way back to Descartes, although its modern support comes mostly from behaviorist psychology. To these, what looks like pain is really just reflexes, counter-arguments. However, there happen to be all sorts of scientific and pro-animal rights counter-counter-arguments, and then further attempted rebuttals and redirects and so on. Suffice it to say that both the scientific and philosophical arguments on either side of the animal suffering issue are involved, abstruse, technical, often formed by self-interest or ideology, and in the end so totally inconclusive 
that as a practical matter, in the kitchen or a restaurant, it all still seems to come down to individual conscience, going with, no pun, your gut. Back to the text. And, as mentioned, they're bottom dwellers and do not like bright light. If a tank of food lobsters is out in the sunlight or a store's fluorescence, the lobsters will always congregate in whatever part is darkest. Fairly solitary in the ocean, they also clearly dislike the crowding that's part of their captivity in tanks, since, as also mentioned, one reason why a lobster's claws are banded on capture is to keep them from attacking one another under the stress of close quarter storage. In any event, at the MLF, standing by the bubbling tanks outside the world's largest lobster cooker, watching the fresh caught lobsters pile over one another, wave their hoppled claws impotently, huddle in the rear corners, or scramble frantically back from the glass as you approach, it is difficult not to sense that they're unhappy or frightened even if it's some rudimentary version of these feelings. And again, why does rudimentariness even enter into it? Why is a primitive, inarticulate form of suffering less urgent or uncomfortable for the person who's helping to inflict it by paying for the food it results in? I'm not trying to give you a PETA-like screed here. At least, I don't think so. I'm trying, rather, to work out and articulate some of the troubling questions that arise amid all the laughter, insultation, and community pride of the Maine Lobster Festival. The truth is that if you, the festival attendee, permit yourself to think that lobsters can suffer and would rather not, the MLF begins to take on the aspect of something like a Roman circus or medieval torture fest. Does that comparison seem a bit much? If so, exactly why? Or what about this one? Is it possible that future generations will regard our present agribusiness and eating practices in much the same way we now view Nero's entertainments or Mengele's experiments? My own initial reaction is that such a comparison is hysterical, extreme. And yet the reason it seems extreme to me appears to be that I believe animals are less morally important than human beings. Footnote 21. Meaning a lot less important, apparently, since the moral comparison here is not the value of one human's life versus the value of one animal's life, but rather the value of one animal's life versus the value of one human's taste for a particular kind of protein. Even the most die-hard carnophile will acknowledge that it's possible to live and eat well without consuming animals. Back to the text. And when it comes to defending such a belief, even to myself, I have to acknowledge that A, I have an obvious selfish interest in this belief, since I like to eat certain kinds of animals and want to be able to keep doing it, and B, I haven't succeeded in working out any sort of personal ethical system in which the belief is truly defensible instead of just selfishly convenient. Given this article's venue and my own lack of culinary sophistication, I'm curious about whether the reader can identify with any of these reactions and acknowledgments and discomforts. I'm also concerned not to come off as shrill or preachy when what I really am is more like confused. For those gourmet readers who enjoy well-prepared and presented meals involving beef, veal, lamb, pork, chicken, lobster, etc., do you think much about the possible moral status and probable suffering of the animals involved? If you do, what ethical convictions have you worked out that permit you not to just eat, but to savor and enjoy flesh-based viands, since, of course, refined enjoyment rather than mere ingestion is the whole point of gastronomy? If, on the other hand, you'll have no truck with confusions or convictions and regard stuff like the previous paragraph as just so much fatuous navel-gazing, 
What makes it feel truly okay, inside, to just dismiss the whole thing out of hand? That is, is your refusal to think about any of this the product of actual thought, or is it just that you don't want to think about it? And if the latter, then why not? Do you ever think, even idly, about the possible reasons for your reluctance to think about it? I'm not trying to bait anyone here. I'm genuinely curious. After all, isn't being extra aware and attentive and thoughtful about one's food and its overall context part of what distinguishes a real gourmet? Or is all the gourmet's extra attention and sensibility just supposed to be sensuous? Is it really all just a matter of taste and presentation? These last few queries, while sincere, obviously involve much larger and more abstract questions about the connections, if any, between aesthetics and morality, about what the adjective in a phrase like the magazine of good living is really supposed to mean. And these questions lead straight away into such deep and treacherous waters that it's probably best to stop the public discussion right here. There are limits to what even interesting persons can ask of each other. Thank you for listening, and have a good day.